Great, thank you. Uh, welcome all to the Health Beyond Research and Innovation Showcase in Women's Health. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we are meeting on and remind people that we are on Aboriginal land. I'd like to acknowledge the elders past, present, and in particular those attending today's events. Uh, my name is Angela Macris and I'm the co-director of WITU Academic Unit and I'm chairing today's event with Professor John Humboldt. It is my pleasure to invite uh, Mr Daryl Harkness, the Chief Executive of the Ingham Institute for Applied Medical Research, to deliver the opening address. Uh, thank you, Angela, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm filling in for Professor Bouquet, Les Bouquet, today. Unfortunately, Les has lost his voice, and for those of you that know Les, I'm sure he's not enjoying that. Um, so I'll give the introduction this morning, and, uh, and in a moment I'll also hand across to Annie Kerry Doyle, who will uh, do an acknowledgement of, of country. So, so welcome to the Women's Health uh, Showcase, proudly co-presented by Professor Angela Macris and Professor John Hyatt, and the Women's Health Initiative Translational Unit, or WITU, uh, at Southwest Sydney Local Health District. I'm delighted to see you uh, all tuning in from across the country, across the nation, I think some uh, internationally, and I can see numbers rising very quickly in terms of participants this morning. Um, can I acknowledge uh, a number of people? Firstly, uh, the program leads uh, for the event, um, Professor Angela Macris, uh, co-director of the uh, WITU, uh, and Professor John Hyde, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology for Southwest Sydney Local Health District, the Ingham Institute, and Western Sydney University. I can also acknowledge uh, some uh, distinguished guests, Professor Josephine Chow. Uh, Josephine is Director of Strategy and Partnerships and Professor of Nursing at uh, the Nursing and Midwifery Alliance for Southwest Sydney Local Health District. Uh, Professor Anne-Marie Hennessy, who is Dean of Medicine, Western Sydney Uni, and co-head of uh, the uh, Academic Unit for Women's Health Initiative Translational Unit, WITU, and uh, Amber, of course, is a member of our Ingham board. Uh, the speakers who are, are uh, talking at today's event, and all the distinguished guests that are joining uh, both nationally and internationally. I think you'll enjoy today's program with presentations, including an introduction to the Women's Health Unit, uh, first trimester predictions, novel, novel therapies, uh, an overview of preeclampsia, and uh, much more. And now I wonder if I could uh, make a comment on behalf of uh, Amanda Larkin, Chief Exec of Southwest Sydney LHD. Um, and, and I know uh, Amanda would like to acknowledge the district's commitment to research. And as many of you know, uh, health research really is, is flourishing in Southwest Sydney. And, and we're proud of the commitment um, that our staff have made to enhancing patient care through their quest uh, for discovery and innovation. Um, also, the commitment to research, innovation, and education is a major foundation for the district's strategic plan and will continue to be a vital strategic priority uh, as we plan for the future. The district's research strategy 2023 is also driving our research to enhance our care and improve the health of our community. A key focus of the plan is ensuring we attract, retain, and nurture emerging and expert researchers in all disciplines. And that's, of course, very, very important. Uh, and I'm excited to see how our pioneering research day will translate into the care of tomorrow. And uh, I know speaking from experience working at the Ingham Institute, Amanda's commitment to research in Southwest Sydney is, is second to none. So a little about the uh, Health Beyond Research uh, and Innovation Showcase series. Uh, these series are presented by our district and the Ingham Institute for Applied Medical Research, and they celebrate the advances in health research, innovation and technology in Southwest Sydney. And we've been delighted to welcome distinguished local and international speakers to these seminars as we, prevent, as we present groundbreaking research to our community and to the world. Um, some comments about the academic unit program, and this is a district program, was established in 2015, and it is continuing to make significant steps to embed clinical research uh, or embed research into clinical practice. It responds directly to the health needs of the community. The units cover the research areas of women's health, uh, limb preservation and wound research, child psychiatry, and the gut and microbiome. And the units build uh, expert multidisciplinary teams who conduct clinical trials, initiate research, and ultimately revolutionize healthcare outcomes. 
Um, so a couple of comments and a brief overview of the WITU academic unit. As I said, it's the Women's Health Initiative Translational Unit, WITU. Uh, it's comprised of clinicians, midwives, scientists, and allied health professionals who share a common goal to improve women's health through medical research. The unit aims to maximize equity, equality, health, and empowerment for all women by creating practices guided by evidence and the lived experience of women and of course, in a culturally respectful way. Uh, researchers are working on understanding and preventing preeclampsia and leading a variety of clinical trials, including investigating how to address iron deficiency during pregnancy. Amongst the many other clinical trials we are undertaking is a study on uh, whether a new mobile phone application can help women identify risks to their pregnancy and seek earlier referral to antenatal services. Uh, some of the key achievements of the uh, of, of WITU, um, the unit is working in partnership with CSIRO, the University of Adelaide, and the National Health and Medical Research Council to increase pregnancy research in many broad areas. It is working with national bodies such as the Society of Obstetric Medicine of Australia and the New Zealand uh, and New Zealand and Ministry of Health to develop guidelines and policies for treating women during pregnancy. It's also implemented a screen online booking, uh, booking in project to improve booking in for a pregnancy. And this project is now complete and will go live as soon as, uh, will go live very shortly. So in conclusion, uh, thank you once again for joining today's seminar on this uh, very, very, very important area of research. I particularly thank the WITU Academic Unit for presenting the seminar and also thank the WITU Unit for your commitment to delivering cutting edge healthcare for your patients. I'm sure you'll be informed and inspired by the advances in this critical research area, which will shape the care we provide in Southwest Sydney and across the world. So thank you. And with that, I'll hand across to Aunty Kerry Doyle. Thank you, Dr. Kerry. I'm Auntie Kerry. I'm the professor who works with Anne Marie Hennessy in the School of Medicine and across for um, the Marajulu Pujari Gumal, our um, sphere CAG. Pardon my voice. So, you know that all of Australia, all of Australia had somebody that called, called it home, that somebody that named it as its own country. And so we know that. Um, each of those people would, would offer a welcome if you were on their country. And I and I acknowledge that that um, people from in this particular audience are from many countries. So my father was Winanini Bujari, but my mother was Katigulyura, and of course I have two Irish grandfathers. And I'm the first born daughter of the first born daughter of the first born daughter since time began. And in saying that, I would like to acknowledge the women of our culture and indeed the women in the audience. I'm hoping that this is working okay because I keep getting messages. To say that um, thank you for the work that you do with women and thank you for the work that you do with our women. We have never had issues of gender in our culture. We have always been equal but it, you can see that we have very, very strong women in our culture. So please let me acknowledge the land and welcome you too if you're on our lands and welcome, welcome and thrice welcome, remembering that the land is our mother and she knows all our footprints and we are all welcome. Thank you. Right. Thank you, uh, Professor Auntie Kerry Doyle, for that introduction. Um, I will be speaking next, and my brief is to introduce uh, WITU and uh, one of the key projects that we've commenced. Um, uh, so to begin with, a bit of an overview of, of WITU. Um, the, it's, as uh, Daryl said, um, it's a multidisciplinary team, and that's just the pictures of some of the people in that structure there, which is aimed at bringing together academia um, of a multidisciplinary nature, as well as research scientists, uh, data scientists, um, to undertake clinical trials and therefore implement change um, in Southwest Sydney LHD for our relatively unique population. 
Um, uh, just to briefly run through some of our uh, some of our work to date, we've been relatively productive with over 60 publications specifically for WITU. We've supported and are supporting six PhD students, two of whom have completed, uh, three sphere uh, midwife research inter interns and have leveraged not an insignificant amount of funding uh, during our time. Um, our work is multifaceted. It includes clinical trials, some of the logos that you can see there, but that's meant to emphasise that they are both clinical, um, international uh, trials into hemolysis of the newborn, uh, COVID-related trials and Ministry of Health work in terms of uh, improving outcomes for mother and baby with the Safer Baby Bundle. Um, other of our work has been investigator initiated. And as I said, it uh, has supported a number of our PhD students and is supported by the research staff. As a brief introduction, um, aspirin has been one of our focuses and Dr. Shanmu Galingam will detail that coming up soon. Models of care and the patient journey um, has been one of our focuses in order to improve women's access, appropriate access to the healthcare system. And Professor Regina Schmid will discuss that. Um, the effect COVID has had um, in this time uh, on pregnancy and its outcomes and Professor Hannah Dalen will speak about that. Early pregnancy assessment, Professor John Hyatt will speak about that and interactions with many other academic units and academic uh, groups such as biome work, sleep disordered, uh, breathing in pregnancy, hyperemesis, and, and, not, not a, and this list is not inclusive of all. I will focus for the rest of my um, time to discuss the screen uh, topic, which is preventative work that we've aimed uh, to try to improve access for women um, to the healthcare system in a triage manner, which is clinically, mean, clinically meaningful. So Screen was created and trialled as a purpose-built app aimed to allow women to access the healthcare system when they're pregnant uh, as early as possible. Why do we need this? Because there are lots of missed opportunities to prevent pregnancy complications and therefore improve the outcomes for women. Um, there are many uh, missed opportunities that we've identified, patient factors. Uh, women obviously are at the centre of the family and therefore have competing interests such as work and family responsibilities and frequently caring responsibilities. Um, there are clinician factors. It is a quite unique uh, way that obstetrics uh, works in that it's really quite um, uh, uh, generalist in that, of course, you need to look after the pregnancy, but also the things that, that women bring to the pregnancy, the myriad of medical disorders, psychosocial issues, um, and it's hard for clinicians to keep up with that in a very busy, time-poor manner. So there have been factors that have limited our uh, opportunities in our preventing. And last thing is hospital factors, which obviously have an impact on patient factors. Um, getting access to the bookings system uh, in a timely manner, organising appointments that uh, women can actually attend. So all of these factors are, are significant in missed opportunities that result in missed preventative um, options for women. So we came up with the screen because ideally the... Um, Ministry of Health would like and clinically would be important that all women are seen within their first or by the end of the first trimester. But we know from data that's already uh, accrued that 30% of all pregnancies in New South Wales do not uh, reach healthcare within the first trimester. 35% um, of Indigenous pregnancies uh, don't see healthcare within the first trimester. And if you look at probably one of the more vulnerable groups, young mothers, so women with no previous experience, um, less those that are women less than 25 years of age, 40% of them are not reaching um, hospital-based healthcare within the first trimester. So lots of, lots of scope for improvement. Just to uh, cite one example from work that Renuka will uh, elaborate on a bit further, we know that 50% of women who would qualify for aspirin to prevent preeclampsia are not offered the aspirin for a myriad of reasons that I've outlined. And also compliance is quite underappreciated um, as having a significant effect on the outcomes. Um, so just to see, just to give you an example of how significant this would be and more uh, looking at the healthcare system, we have about 14,000 deliveries in the southwest Sydney. And if 1% of those are going to develop preterm preeclampsia, that's 140 women. If they all took aspirin and achieved a 7% reduction in the rate of preterm preeclampsia, that means only 42 women would have preterm preeclampsia. And that would mean a significant saving of $7.5 million per year for this for Southwest Sydney LHD. And let alone extrapolating that to other, to other more broader um, LHDs. 
So we created a screen and this was a multidisciplinary group that got together to try to focus on as many aspects that was practical um, so that women could self-create their medical records in a meaningful fashion that would allow us to triage them for early access for their new pregnancy, not necessarily their first. Um, and this is now transformed into something that we call booking in my pregnancy. Um, and what it is, is an online app. So it's not an actual uh, Android or iPhone. It sort of exists on the internet and it's offered to women in three different languages. So English, Arabic and uh, Vietnamese, and also has a medical, medical practitioner portal, which we'll discuss in some detail. And what women do is they start the survey and answer a number of questions. Firstly, we've uh, collected some identifying information and this will allow us to identify them within the healthcare system if they exist or to create a medical record number. So that is all pre-done before they turn up for their hospital visit. Um, it's also geo-locked uh, for reasons of workload and also uh, how work is distributed. Um, we are interested pre predominantly in women in Southwest Sydney LHD. So women insert their address uh, via a find address um, app and then it geo locks them to within our LHD and to the relevant uh, hospital. In this particular case, this woman's allocated to Liverpool Hospital. Um, what then happens is that they answer a number of questions, just as an example. They're relatively simple, aimed at being easy to be replicated across the different languages. Um, and some of them are about their previous healthcare, some are about their current state, and some of them are associated with some pop-ups of information for women. Um, because there are certainly things that women already know coming into a pregnancy is an issue, and it's always hard to find clinically meaningful, reliable information about how to make changes in pregnancy. Because certainly in pregnancy, women are very motivated to make change to their health care. And so these are pop-ups regarding stopping um, smoking, their uh, weight and BMI, as well as if they've got severe hyperemesis gravidarum, about resources that they can access till they, till they reach the healthcare system. Um, as I said, the areas are many. It's about them, it's about their and their family health. Uh, it's about their psychosocial risk factors, uh, as well as uh, trying to introduce them to other, of, other avenues of education, such as um, antenatal screening. Um, the woman completes the survey. They then uh, they can download a copy of all their responses and their risk assessment so that they can forward it to family, friend, partners, GP, have a look at it for themselves. At the end of it is a, a list of all the links that they were interested in that they want to look up afterwards. And that information simultaneously gets sent to the geo-locked hospital. So if you're in Fairfield to Fairfield Hospital for the uh, midwifery staff to triage and forward on to booking staff to make an appointment in a timely fashion. Um, and that will reduce not only the stress for women trying to contact the bookings office who are frequently busy and dealing not only with, uh, with um, antenatal patients, but also with the myriad of all the other patients in the hospital. Um, and then puts the onus on us to contact them. And it means that women who speak only Arabic and Vietnamese can similarly access the same system in a timely manner. Um, the printout looks something like this. I've obviously de-identified it, but what's important about it is the various uh, uh, areas that we've identified that might be of a uh, potential improvement for these women. Um, and I've only listed some blood disorders, asthma, gestational diabetes, thyroid disorders, and preeclampsia. So um, in summary, women complete the online uh, information. It goes through a background algorithm that calculates their risk and the areas that we've to date in the current version have looked at preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, cardiac history, uh, DVT and PE risk, hyperemesis, recurrent miscarriage and preterm labour, as well as thyroid disease, which is uh, an increasing problem in our district. Um, so how accurate is the data? I mean, it's all great and well to get women to fill it out, but is it, is it reliable information that's coming in? Um, and what we found it is actually re amazingly reliable. Um, so this is a bland Altman plot looking at screen data versus the measured BMI. And this was the women in this particular instance filled out the app while they were waiting for their midwifery visit. So it was as close a wait as we could muster. Um, and the dotted lines indicate 95% allowance of error. Um, so as you can see, the BMI is pretty close to uh, what the women indicated. From a sort of numerical perspective, the screen had a BMI average of this population of 27.2 versus measured, which was 27.1. It's really not statistically different. Um, looking at other things such as age, you can see the differences in the means of the, of the two uh, different modes of measurement, and they were all very, very accurate and certainly clinically um, accurate. Um, a difference of a pre-pregnancy weight of 72.5 versus 72.2 is really not a significant factor. 
Um, then in terms of predicting risk, um, so just to, a little bit of background information, um, in order to assess how reliable something is, um, usually a Cohen's Kappa coefficient is used and anything really with a Kappa coefficient of 0.61 and above is, has shows substantial agreement with what you're trying to predict or what you're trying to assess. So in this instance, we're trying to uh, compare the screen at prediction versus what the midwives uh, decided was a, a a risk factor for these particular women. And looking just to the VTE, um, we found that there was 96.8% concordance that, and that sort of correlated to a coefficient of 0 0.75, so a pretty substantial agreement that the screen um, overcalled it in 2.1% and undercalled it in 1.1%. So of course, nothing is uh, as good as a human um, to some extent, but certainly the, the, the error is, uh, is minimal. Um, so then we went to look at GDM, and I think this emphasises one of the factors that I discussed earlier, which is the clinician factor. Um, we just did what we looked at the prediction by the midwives of the GDM risk compared to what the app showed, and we found a Kappa coefficient that was terrible. So I thought, what's happened here? This is really quite bad, and it's based on quite well-adapted, guideline-based, um, evidence-supported uh, risk factors. Um, so then we went through and thought, well, is, it, is it the individual risk factors that are not as accurate? But as you can see from those cappers, they're all 0.8 or above. So really the BMI, the age, the, their previous GDM, the, the first degree relative, whether they had PCOS or a baby of more than 4.5 kilos was pretty well correlated. So then if we took those individual risk factors as assessed uh, by the midwives, we actually found that the Kappa coefficient was 0.8. So we thought from depression, we went to joy uh, because what we realised was that this was a missed opportunity to identify women earlier on because of the complexities of what happens on a day-to-day -day basis, competing interests when you're assessing a woman, the phone's going off, the screaming three-year-old. Um, and certainly the app would unify this because it puts whatever has been uh, evidence-based into practice even though the individual risk factors were identified, uh, the coalition of those risk factors into um, an individualised risk was lacking. Um, there's also, as I said, a practitioner portal, and the aim um, of that is to allow um, uh, practitioners in the community um, to uh, refer women as they see appropriate, um, either because the women have completed their app or because they've completed the uh, risk assessment with the woman, um, and a means of providing the, uh, the referral in a way that means it doesn't get lost. So at the moment it is faxed. Um, and as many of you know, faxes break down. There's no um, means to do it uh, by email at the moment. And so unfortunately the system has not kept up with modern day technology. So this works around this to some extent. It also allows for clinicians who might not be as confident in treating uh, women um, who are pregnant to risk assess their patient uh, without putting in all the technical details at the beginning so, and then provide the practitioner with uh, quite clinical um, information. So, for example, if a woman has got a high risk for preeclampsia, it says, please give this woman 150 milligrams of aspirin if it's not contraindicated and look at their dietary calcium. And that's the case for the aspirin, the DVT risk, et cetera. Um, so it's really, again, to try to make clinicians' life a little bit easier in a, in a busy clinical setting. Um, similarly, the clinician can download the referral letter and can keep it uh, for their records. And at the same time, again, it gets emailed to the geo-locked hospital, so it's being sent to the appropriate hospital. Um, that patient, depending on their risk profile, might not be appropriate to deliver at that hospital. So someone who's very high risk might not be okay to deliver at Fairfield and might need to be transferred uh, to Fairfield. But this allows a meaningful and quick way that that referral can be forwarded on uh, by email to the relevant hospital um, who will look after the woman during her pregnancy. So what now? So we're uh, going to roll out this district-wide, um, which is really part of an implementation project and ultimately hopefully commercialise this, um, this tool. Uh, it's launched in the South West Sydney LHD and we've had incredible support from a myriad of partners, including the media unit that makes some really beautiful flyers that we're going to distribute to the GPs. There's posts, uh, posters that will be that are generated in some social media tiles that have been made. Um, we've had incredible PHN support uh, in order to roll this out. And of course, it will also um, allow us to undertake more ongoing research to improve this as a tool for predicting um, in the future. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we're leaving all questions to the end. So if anyone does have any questions, please pop them um, in the Q&A. Um, 
And, um, and I'd like to introduce the next speaker, which is Professor John Hyatt, who's going to give us some more details on first trimester prediction of preterm preeclampsia. Thank you, Dr. Good morning, everybody, and um, thanks for joining us with this webinar. Um, I'm relatively new to um, southwestern Sydney and to Liverpool and the Ingham Institute. And uh, I think it's perhaps important just to identify one of the reasons I came to work here. And that is that the uh, group that have been working here with We Too and um, with Angela Renuka, who you'll hear uh, later, and also Anne-Marie Hennessy, are recognised as one of the preeminent groups managing preeclampsia in Australia. And it's great to be able to come along as an obstetrician uh, and join them um, here in southwestern Sydney. So I'm going to talk about some work on um, screening for preterm preeclampsia. Um, here you can see just conceptually how we have addressed screening from an antenatal perspective. So on the left-hand side is our traditional way of assessing women in pregnancy, which is we get them to come to our antenatal clinic starting at around 16 weeks. The reason being um, babies start to move around 16 or 18 weeks. So traditionally that was when women first knew they were pregnant. Um, obviously, obstetricians didn't believe that missing your period was something that was a sign of pregnancy. Um, and you can see then that we see women on a monthly basis, then a fortnightly basis, and then weekly. And the reason that this was constructed in this way was that people knew that preeclampsia was a very significant condition. And they also recognized that it tended um, to occur more frequently towards the end of pregnancy. So therefore, there were more visits at the end of pregnancy. You can see that this was devised in 1929, and you can certainly recognize the structure of antenatal care today. Um, you'll also recognize that a guy called Greenwood um, was responsible for this. He worked for the Ministry of Health in the UK, and you'll be pleased to know he was an accountant. <laughs> On the right-hand side, you can see what I think should be the model for modern-day care. And, and this really is constructed to first take account of some really significant risks um, to uh, mothers, and those are domestic violence um, and mental health issues. Those are now actually the two main killers of women during the course of pregnancy, which is, I think, really, really sad for us from a societal perspective. Um, just look as well that we've got this bookended by the concept of actually making sure that we're right to go with preconceptual care. And then once we've had a baby, making sure that we're um, able to make sure that they, um, you know, really meet their um, the, the best possible uh, outcomes for their health and indeed their long term well being. The yellow and the purple bits are just to show a slight change in this pyramid. So a concept now about actually seeing people from a prediction perspective early in pregnancy where we can then proactively try and do something to improve outcomes. And then the purple bit is probably similar to what we do at the moment. It's this reactive care based on surveillance that then allows us to intervene. But you can see that in early pregnancy now, prediction becomes much more important um, and really the surveillance and intervention is at a later stage. Next slide. I better hurry up. So preeclampsia um, is a condition that affects about two to five percent of pregnant women, and it can be very significant. You can see the list of potential risks to mothers and their babies. Worldwide, about 60,000 uh, women die of preeclampsia each year, uh, and also about 500,000 babies, either because of prematurity or because of their small size when they're born. Next slide, thanks. So we actually now understand quite a lot about the underlying etiology of preeclampsia. It's expressed here on this slide. And really the important thing is that it now comes in stages. So we recognize that the end point of this condition, which is the way we make a clinical diagnosis, has come after um, other stages of disease development. And the concept of first trimester screening is if we can actually identify one of those early stages, then we can potentially either stop the process or turn the clock back so women have better outcomes. Next slide. So we've been validating a UK-based screening algorithm for preeclampsia, and uh, we've done this in Sydney. 
And this involves not just taking a history, which was what Angela showed you with the app, but also um, now measuring things. So on the left-hand side, we measure uterine artery uh, blood flow coming to the uterus. Um, then the next thing we measure is a mother's blood pressure. Then the next thing we measure are hormones produced by the placenta to tell us how the, uh, the placenta is working. And on the right-hand side, you can see that when we do this, we have about a 90% detection rate um, for what's called a 10% screen positive rate. Thank you. Now, just to go through some of those individual bits and pieces, blood pressure on the left normally drops during the course of pregnancy and then rises again towards the end of pregnancy. On the right-hand side, I just wanted to show you all the maternal characteristics that affect a woman's blood pressure. And this means when we measure blood pressure and we have an observation, we have to actually relate it to what we would expect on the basis of her own individual characteristics. And we do this using a mechanism known as momming, uh, means or, or, or measures of the median. Um, next slide. Quality assurance is really important to us when we screen populations. And this is just an example of an audit tool that we can use so that when we look at blood pressure measurements, there's 500 here, we can see whether our population actually matches what we would expect worldwide. Next one, please. Moving on to the biochemistry, probably the red bars are the ones to focus on. And you can see that these two markers, HAPE on the left, PLGF on the right, are both reduced in pregnancies that go on to get preeclampsia before 34 weeks. Next slide. And finally, we do an ultrasound scan where we assess the uterine artery blood flow. So that's blood flow coming up to the uterus. And again, it tells us about how likely it is that the placenta is well oxygenated. Next slide. And once again, we convert what we see on the ultrasound into these MOMs. So it's a comparison of what we would expect. And on the left-hand side, you can just see all the maternal characteristics that actually affect how much blood flow goes to your uterus. And on the right-hand side um, is a little table that tells me how I can calculate a level of risk for that particular individual once I've looked at this uh, particular tool, blood flow. Next. Once again, it's really important that we make sure that we do this in a standardized way and we make sure that we are comparable with other groups. So we have lots of quality assurance going on. This is just the example of a single sonographer, all the scans that they've made, and we can look at the measurements that they've made and see whether they're in the normal range, which lies between those two red lines. Next slide. So where are we at at the moment? Well, we have validated a screening tool for early preeclampsia. And on the left-hand side, you can see that in the context of identifying women that will get preeclampsia before 34 weeks, we can actually identify about 90% of those women. So that's exactly the same as they found when they developed this model in the UK. Next slide. I'm not going to talk about aspirin apart from to say that what we've done is link the prediction model to some treatment and it's been very successful and Renuka will talk about that in more detail. Next slide. And what we know is because we have a really strong predictive test and we're able to couple it to a really effective treatment, we can actually prevent about 80% of babies that were born because their mothers had preeclampsia in early pregnancy. We can prevent 80% of those babies born before 34 weeks um, from being delivered. And that means they don't need to go to the nursery. That means from a healthcare um, uh, perspective, costs are much lower. It also means outcomes are much better for both those mothers and those babies. But if we just stick to the health uh, economic analysis, you can see there's a whole load of yellow dots that's what we call a sensitivity analysis. So it's allowing for lots of different variables. Um, there's a little blue dot in the middle of them, which basically shows us that if we do this first trimester screening test and couple it to uh, some preventative treatment, we can actually first reduce the number of cases of preeclampsia we see. And second, we can reduce the overall cost of healthcare. So it's win-win. And this is what we call dominant when we compare it to the standard of care that we have today. Next slide. So how does this apply to Southwestern Sydney? 
Well, we have five maternity units in southwestern Sydney. Angela's already told you that that's about 14,000 deliveries a year. That's 4% of all the women that deliver in Australia each year. Our hospitals are very different, but what we need to do is find a way of being able to off offer this screening test throughout those five hospitals in a way that is meaningful uh, to patients so that they come and have that test at 12 weeks. And this is where I think this um, has synergy with the work that Angela's been doing al already um, with the, the screen app. Next slide. So what do we want to do? Well, I think we're really focused on this challenge of improving access to care. We recognize that if we do not see women early, then we're not able to provide them with advice to prevent adverse outcomes. And that's, I think, potentially a tragedy in the making. We know that if we can predict and prevent early onset preeclampsia, we can reduce rates of preterm birth. We actually have other screening algorithms for things like structural cardiac disease, so we can actually identify heart problems and make sure that those children get appropriate treatment as soon as they're delivered. We also have other predictive models for small babies. Those are the babies that are most likely to be injured during the process of birthing. And so again, we can see that this test will allow us to reduce um, accidents at the time of birth and also stillbirth. Next slide. So I'm nearly finished. Um, we know when we implement something new in medicine, um, that it can be a fairly tortuous process as shown on the, the little um, uh, graph on the uh, left-hand side. We know there are roadblocks. The roadblocks are how do we make sure that our uh, women who are pregnant know about these tests? And how do we make sure our healthcare providers know about the tests and how they work? We then have these issues with communication. And I think Angela's already highlighted the fact that we're going to send the fax machine to the powerhouse museum. Um, so hopefully we'll improve referral pathways, we'll improve the way that we give results. We have to look at how we interact with people uh, across our culturally and linguistically diverse community. We have to look at the resources that we need to provide this test to 14,000 women, and we have to re re uh, liaise with other services to make sure that we have everything in place for a smooth experience for our patient. I'm going to stop there, I think. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, John. It's good to see the health economists um, involved back in the 1920s. Um, <laughs> um, as I said before, if there's any questions, please uh, pop them in the Q&A at the bottom and we'll um, address them at the end. Um, next, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Renuka Shanmuga Lincoln, who's going to present um, a presentation on preeclampsia can be prevented. This is some work that she did in Southwest Sydney LHD um, with we 2 Thanks, Renuka. Thank you, Angela. Um, so my name is Renuka Shanmugalingam, and I'll be presenting on uh, my work on the um, prevention of preeclampsia with the use of aspirin. The data that I'll be presenting today was mainly um, based on my PhD research work, which was largely supported by WITU within the um, Southwestern Sydney um, Local Health District. So as John has already touched on before, what is preeclampsia? Pre Sorry, can you see my slides advancing? Yes. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so preeclampsia is a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, which is defined by the onset of hypertension with clinical and biochemical features of end organ impairment after 20 weeks of gestation. Now, um, preeclampsia is a global annual incidence of about 4 to 10% of all pregnancies. And in Australia, this is reported to occur in about 1% to 2% of all pregnancies annually. However, in the southwestern Sydney, this has been reported to be higher, between 5 to 8%, mainly due to the high risk demographic that we care for. In Australia, uh, preeclampsia also accounts for 5% of direct maternal mortality and 10% of perinatal mortality. So I thought I'll touch briefly on the pathophysiology of preeclampsia and also just build on a little bit of um, what John has mentioned before in his presentation, just because if we understand the pathophysiology of preeclampsia, we'll have a better understanding on how aspirin potentially works in preventing preeclampsia. So as John mentioned, preeclampsia, the pathophysiology of preeclampsia rather has been described as a two-stage disease process. Now in normal pregnancy, 
there's a local immunological interaction between the cytotrophoblast and the maternal uterine wall, which then allows for deep invasion of the cytotrophoblast into the maternal uterine wall, and also for pseudovascular genesis of the maternal spiral arteries, which will then allow for the development of a placenta that will be well vascularized and support the, um, the growing fetus for the duration of the pregnancy. However, in women who are at high risk of developing preeclampsia, this process is quite often flawed from the very beginning of the pregnancy, which then results in the development of a placenta that is highly susceptible to ischemic stress as the pregnancy progresses on. So with the developing uh, or with the increasing stress from the pregnancy and the increasing ischemia on the susceptible placenta, the placenta then starts to produce or rather lead to an imbalance in an angiogenic um, um, bioprofile, which then leads to the clinical manifestation of preeclampsia. Now, looking specifically at the immunological factors in preeclampsia, we do understand that in normal pregnancy, the, the, um, there's a switch in the maternal immunological profile from a predominance of a pro-inflammatory cytokine profile, which is the Th1 cytokine profile, to the anti-inflammatory cytokine profile, which is the Th2 cytokine profile. Now, this really allows for a state of immunotolerance in pregnancy in order for the placenta to develop and for the pregnancy to progress on. However, this process, again, is flawed in women who are at high risk of developing preeclampsia, where she continues to have a predominance of the pro-inflammatory Th1 cytokine profile. So who are these women who are at risk of preeclampsia? And as Angela and um, John had mentioned before, we now have various forms in screening women who are at risk of developing preeclampsia. Uh, most clinical guidelines at present continue to recommend the use of clinical risk factors. However, um, the use of clinical risk factors alone would only help us identify 38% of these women. And therefore, um, we're currently moving towards more sensitive measures of um, measuring, uh, of identifying women at high risk for developing preeclampsia, such as the first trimester screening that John elaborated on. But why is it important that we identify these women? And as, have you heard, as you have heard multiple times today, and this is really to intervene early and minimize the risk of preeclampsia in these women. And we now know that we have aspirin as an effective preventative tool for these women. So the use of aspirin in the prevention of preeclampsia really has been studied over 40 years now. However, the data on the use of aspirin has been largely variable with more recent RCTs demonstrating a risk reduction of up to 70%. Now, the variability that we've observed over the years has largely been attributed towards the heterogeneity of these studies, in which um, there has been significant variation in the way women were risk stratified, in the way preeclampsia was defined in the studies, the gestation at which aspirin were initiated, and also the dose of aspirin that was used. Now, additionally, we still do not have a good understanding on the importance of compliance and potentially resistance with the use of aspirin in preventing preeclampsia in high-risk women. So with that in mind, the research that we had conducted mainly focused on understanding the mechanism of action by which aspirin prevents preeclampsia. We also looked to understand the pharmacokinetics of aspirin in pregnancy and to have a better understanding on the factors that influence clinical outcomes in these high-risk women with the use of aspirin. So in doing so, we conducted an observational um, longitudinal cohort study where we recruited high-risk pregnant women from three hospitals within the Southwestern Sydney region, and we followed up with them through the duration of their pregnancy. We recruited a total of 220 women, out of whom um, 100 and, uh, women, and data from 180 high-risk women who are available for analysis. Um, out of these 187 women, 145 of them were on aspirin and 42 of them were not on aspirin. So the first part of the study was really to understand the mechanism by which aspirin works. And we looked specifically at the anti-inflammatory pathway with specific focus on the aspirin-triggered lipoxin pathway. Now, what we found was that women who were at high risk of developing preeclampsia, as represented by the red line here, were found to have low concentration of endogenous lipoxin A4. Now, lipoxin A4 is a naturally produced lipoxin that has strong anti-inflammatory properties. Now, 
we found that when high risk women were prescribed aspirin, along with the prescription of aspirin, we found that these women developed or rather um, had mounted an increased concentration of 50 epilipoxin A4, which is also known as aspirin triggered lipoxin. Now, this 15 epilipoxin A4 does mimic the endogenous properties of lipoxin A4, therefore indicating that aspirin does play a role in uh, manipulating the um, anti inflammatory lipoxins. Now, along with those changes, we also observed that women who were prescribed aspirin, as represented by the purple lines here, had lower plasma concentration of pro-inflammatory IL-8 cytokines and had higher concentrations of anti-inflammatory IL-10 cytokines. And along with these changes, we also noticed that women who were prescribed aspirin had higher concentrations of PLGF, which is an angiogenic marker of placental good health. So putting this together, we hypothesize that perhaps aspirin does play an anti-inflammatory role in those very early placental developmental stages. Then in looking at the pharmacokinetics of aspirin in pregnancy, we compared the use of 100 milligrams of aspirin and 150 milligrams of aspirin in pregnancy. And what we found was that in pregnancy, um, 150 milligrams of aspirin demonstrated the pharmacokinetic profile that would normally be observed with the use of 100 milligrams of aspirin in the non-pregnant state, therefore suggesting that there's a need to adjust the dose of aspirin in pregnancy, perhaps due to the increased physiological clearance of aspirin in pregnancy. Following that, we looked at understanding the factors that influence clinical efficacy of aspirin in the prevention of preeclampsia. Now, based on the existing literature, we have a much better understanding in, in knowing that aspirin needs to be initiated prior to 16 weeks of gestation. We also now have a better understanding on the appropriate dose um, for, um, in, in prevention of preeclampsia, but we wanted to explore the influence of the adequate adherence with aspirin in pregnancy. And so in our cohort of women, we examined their PF100 activity, which is a marker of platelet aggregation, along with their plasma salicylic acid level in determining their degree of adherence with aspirin to the duration of the study. And we found that women who were adequately adherent with aspirin had much better clinical outcomes where they were noted to have lower rates of preeclampsia, gestational hypertension, and intrauterine growth restriction and they were also found to have lower rates of preterm delivery in comparison to women who were not adequately adherent with aspirin. But astonishingly, we found that in our cohort of women, 44% of them were not adequately adherent with aspirin. And in looking at this, we went back to the women to understand the factors that influence their adherence with aspirin in pregnancy. And in doing that, we conducted a mixed method um, study. We found various factors that really influenced adherence in these women, but two factors really stood out. Pill burden and its associated non-intentional emission of aspirin was a clear issue. In addition to that, communication and relationship with the healthcare providers played a major role in influencing women's adherence with their prescribed therapy, and in this case, aspirin. So putting all of that together, we now have a much better understanding that aspirin is more certainly an effective prophylactic intervention in preventing preeclampsia in high-risk women, especially when prescribed optimally. Now, moving forward, the real challenge here is screening and early identification of these women in order for us to intervene early and put, it, put across or put in place the necessary intervention. And this is where um, Angela's intervention um, and John Hyde's intervention comes in place. But it's also important that we emphasize to the women the importance of adherence to clear and consistent communication. Um, with that, I'd like to thank WITU and everyone who supported the studies that were conducted as part of this PhD. Great, thanks Renuka, thanks for that incredible work. Um, as I said before, if there's any questions, please pop them in the Q&A and we'll take questions um, at, uh, to the relevant people at the end of the presentations. 
Um, the next presentation is a pre-recorded presentation and that's by Professor Anne-Marie Hennessy and that's looking at some of the more basic science work that we too has done, uh, looking at some experimental and novel therapies uh, for the treatment of preeclampsia. Just find it in two seconds. That's the one. Yep, great. Thank you. Oh. Sorry if you bear with us for a minute, just technical issues. I'm surprised that we haven't had any earlier. There's always technical issues. I think we're good to go. Hi, everybody. Um, this is the talk on novel therapies and follows on nicely from the other talks that you've heard so far today. Uh, Angela Macros, who you've spoken to today, and I've been working on this solidly for the last 20 years. And we have got some really exciting news on novel therapies for preeclampsia. So just to remind you that the disease that we study has two phases. The first phase is where something goes wrong with the placenta that's contributed to by immunological factors, genetic factors, environmental factors. And we think that COVID recently and even the bushfires of January 2020 were contributors to rates of preeclampsia that we saw. Um, but we move into the second stage of the disease where the mother gets sick with high blood pressure or protein in their urine. Uh, and it's uh, this thrust of this talk is going to be about that stage two treatment where we try and correct the high blood pressure and the proteinuria stop the mother fitting to allow her to continue safely with the pregnancy. The kinds of molecules that we've been studying with time best summarized here are circulating factors or proteins that come out of the placental bed uh, and by circulating around in the mother's circulation make her sick and of course can impact on the growth and development of the baby. So let's imagine for a moment a 19 year old who comes to see us um, felt pretty well through most of the pregnancy but has suddenly been noted to have a blood pressure of 160 on 90, maybe at 29 or 32 weeks of the pregnancy. Uh, and this particular lady, maybe she was thought to have had a kidney disease from childhood. And we do some kidney protein tests and we see that that is gradually rising as the weeks of her pregnancy progress. You'll have seen from the earlier presentations that we now have a blood test that we can do that looks specifically at the functions of the placenta and helps us work out whether this is preeclampsia or not. And this ratio speaks to proteins that we've been studying, one that this goes up because it's toxic in the bloodstream called SFLT1, and the other one, the placental growth factor goes down because it's being soaked up by this toxic compound and that ratio goes off. We've been using the ratio as a way of helping us determine uh, the next stage for the woman. Uh, so in this particular lady that I had seen, her ratio started to go up. It was stable initially, and that allowed us to keep her at work because we could see that the placenta was holding its own. But the point at which she needed to be delivered, um, that ratio is extremely high. Some quite famous people do get preeclampsia and that's the most famous photo of preeclampsia in the modern era with Kim Kardashian wandering around with extreme swelling uh, and she had complications related to preeclampsia. If we'd seen either Kim or our 19 year old at the time when this disease is taking off, Let's say we were at 29 weeks of the pregnancy. How can we move things forward so that we can treat uh, the disease safely? We've been undertaking testing uh, in both mouse and in non-human primate uh, models. And this is a baboon that we've been studying over the years. And we've been able to show that by reducing the blood flow to the placenta, the mother gets high blood pressure and protein in their urine. We can also create the same signs by manipulating some of those compounds that I showed you earlier, inflammatory, inflammatory compounds that are coming out of the placental bed. And it's those that we've been able to target. We've been able to show that the timing of the rise of these toxic compounds exactly manages the time when the high blood pressure occurs. And in this diagram, that's that uh, dark blue line and the red line indicating that the timing has been important in our research. Um, some compounds seem to rise later on in the sequence and that's this light green line that's not as uh, indicated to us the timing is not such that we would necessarily um, target that compound for treatment so this was some demonstrating that in our model 
once we uh, reduce the blood flow to the placenta, we get a rise in blood pressure, as you can see in the first graph, and a rise in protein over that two week period, very similar to the kind of pattern we see in women. And that times with a quite significant rise in this soluble flat one dangerous compound that's in the circulation. So what can we do to try and treat the disease? We can try and stop the protein in the urine, stop the high blood pressure, but ultimately try and turn off that biochemical signal, which is to decrease the soluble FLT1 and to increase the placental growth factor to see if we can correct the disease. Um, one of the approaches that we've tried in combination with our partners overseas is plasmapheresis, and that's where you wash the blood of those toxic compounds. That's a somewhat complicated process. Um, this work was first done actually in humans, and we uh, looked at more detail at ways that we could try and add to, to our understanding of those pathways. And in this um, model in our hands, every time we wash the blood with a pheresis uh, procedure, we saw a decrease in the placental in the soluble flat one immediately afterwards, and a somewhat stabilization of the blood pressure is demonstrated in the green graph here. Other experimental techniques we've tried was to to provide a vascular endothelial growth factor, which is a companion molecule to this pathway, and it didn't work. But we did have a bingo moment. Dr. Macris, uh, as part of her work, injected placental growth factor into the model. And that showed in the green line of animals that were undergoing no treatment and the red line those who got the placental growth factor and we saw a decrease in the high blood pressure so a resolution of some of the hypertension and the proteinuria went away this data was the first time ever in a primate that we were able to demonstrate a reversal of those signs while keeping the pregnancy going and that fitted beautifully with data from richard levine's group in 2005 showing that this low placental growth factor, the black lines here, and women in late pregnancy was a clear marker of um, the placenta being in trouble. So uh, we wanted to very much more specifically target the soluble flat one or the PLGF, and we've done that most recently with a small inhibitory RNA molecule called an siRNA. And this diagram here shows the siRNA treated animals with the, in blue, where we've seen a nice drop off of the soluble flat one when we've treated them uh, compared to the red line animals here that got no treatment and look again for the first time using RNA therapy able to show the blue line that we could control the blood pressure back to normal levels uh, where we saw this high blood pressure in the untreated animals and that was published with our American colleagues now about three or four years ago. Um, this is a reversal of the colours of my apologies, but being able to show that the untreated animals kept getting more protein in their urine, whereas the red line, the treated animals did not have any increase in their protein in their urine with time. So we were onto something here, an RNA therapy that could be absorbed. Uh, these were mouse studies that showed that the compound went to the placenta and bound to the placental surface, which is where the trouble's coming from. And we had a target for treatment. So going back to how we use this uh, soluble flat one in our diagnosis, in normal pregnancy, quite low levels in the green, but when women get uh, the severe form of preeclampsia, sometimes called HELP syndrome, the levels are extremely high and we wanted to target these with our therapy. That led to us being awarded a $1.9 million NH and MRC grant over the last three years with a specific brief to look at the safety uh, particularly liver safety in the mother, safe for the baby's growth and development. How could we cost this out to be cheaply delivered around the, the uh, globe to countries that need it the most? How is it stored? And some of our thinking around storage of these compounds in refrigeration is exactly the thinking that led to the way that you saw your Pfizer and your uh, Moderna vaccine in a, in a fridge so that they're adequately stored. We wanted to get around the issues of cold storage so that this could be delivered in African countries where that's not possible. And of course, the timing strategies we're examining at the moment. And this work is just coming to its conclusion, uh, but ongoing studies to develop a safe compound is going to be funded by our partners in the USA and backed by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as a result of the contribution that we've been able to make to novel therapies for preeclampsia. Uh, these slides are uh, not very inclusive enough of all of the members of our team 
that have worked with us to, to bring this work um, to the stage we're at at the moment. And more importantly, they're the faces that you've seen today and our partners around Sydney and uh, internationally who have helped with this work. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, again, if there's any questions, please put them in the Q&A and we'll um, address them at the end. So from the molecular level now to the big picture healthcare level, I'd like to introduce Professor Virginia Schmid, who's a Professor of Midwifery at Western Sydney University, who's going to um, present a talk on It Takes a Village, facilitating continuity, collaboration and coordination to support women experiencing a high-risk pregnancy. Thanks, Virginia. Great. Thanks. Um, just let me know that you can hear me every now and then. I'm, I'm noting internet um, sort of gets a bit wobbly. Um, so it takes a village is a, um, a phrase that has come from an interview with a health professional in this um, very collaborative project across Southwest Sydney LHD, looking at pathways of care for women who are experiencing a high risk pregnancy. So very much the women that we've been discussing this morning, um, and also women with comorbid, um, uh, particularly with mental health. So we've been particularly interested in mapping some of the models of care that are in place and women's perceptions and responses responses to that, as well as health professionals' perspectives. But to care for women, um, the, um, this, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to move to the next slide. Certainly one of the um, uh, concepts is that it really takes a very well-coordinated, well-connected, well-communicating multidisciplinary um, team of people. So our team has been working together for quite some time now because some of our data was collected pre-COVID, um, which is um, helpful, I hope. Um, and um, we worked, so we're really a team that are looking around um, the different models of, of care. So the CMCs have been heavily involved um, in collaborate, collaborating in this, as well as the WITU team, um, and we received some funding from WITU as well as Best Start and uh, Maradula. So the aim of the presentation is, which is very brief, because Hannah and I are sharing our slot, I think, is to look at maternity consumers as well as health professionals' perspectives of what are the key elements or, and enablers of models of care that support women experiencing physical and mental health um, complications in pregnancy. The methods we've used have been um, quite diverse. So we actually undertook a linked data analysis and I won't be talking to that today, but Hannah has led that piece of work. We conducted the research in four maternity units, so four of the five units, um, focusing on those with models of care. Um, we've um, and these are the models of care that we looked at. We undertook um, a case review to map pathways and we mapped sort of composite pathways of 10 women in each of the different models, plus bringing all of that together into um, one set of mapping. Um, and we've looked, uh, interviewed 39 women uh, and we worked with some medical students in, in that regard as well and um, 31 health professionals. So in terms of a summary of the case um, file review, so the actual mapping of those journeys, we noted that on average women who have a high risk pregnancy, and of course this is very diverse, so we had a, a large range, but have up to 24 um, appointments um, on average. The majority of those at that time were coming in to the clinic and did continue a lot through COVID as well, even though women were anxious, they still um, uh, um, for a high risk pregnancy came to be monitored. Um, they received, the women that we mapped received care from up to five different um, clinical services and just around 37% of those appointments were with a known clinician. So each time they first saw a clinician, obviously unknown, but we then gathered data about did they then see a known clinician subsequently. And only one out of five of the appointments that occurred with different services occurred on the same day. So sometimes we observed in those records that women came in a couple of times in one week or once one week and, and the following week to see someone else. This is what it, it looked 
like when we did some of the, the mapping. And the main thing to point out here, so this is a composite model of women experiencing antenatal high-risk care through just basically through the antenatal high-risk clinic, through what we described as standard care for a high-risk pregnancy. And the circles around the individual clinicians there indicate that that was an unknown person for that woman. So this was the first time that that woman had met that particular particular clinician and so we saw a lot of this when we mapped the composite journey and women having um, more the standard care model as opposed to when women were in one of the models of care so we looked at the high-risk pregnancy midwife um, model at Campbelltown the high-risk pregnancy uh, midwife supporting safe start um, so women with mental health concerns at Liverpool the GDM clinic at uh, Fairfield and women having both a safe start support for mental health and FGM at, at Bankstown um, and so taking somebody having a high risk midwife pregnancy support and some level of coordination you can see that with the circles there they're basically seeing, seeing more known people throughout the pregnancy pregnancy. Um, we've then seen the data from the qualitative um, interviews with, with women, um, both those women uh, receiving care in the st uh, standard high-risk clinic and women receiving care in a model of care. So for those in a model of care, the core things really are around this relational support that they receive, being known by the care providers, being understood, um, being trusted, and um, so being trusted by by the professional, but also trusting and having confidence in the professional themselves, being treated with respect and having information that is consistent. Um, in contrast to where women received um, a standard high-risk pregnancy care, where they saw multiple providers, and so challenges of accessing the information that they wanted, um, not liking, so we're using the term high-risk pregnancy here as well in this presentation, but not liking the term to be known as a high-risk pregnancy. Um, uh, being viewed as a number, not feeling heard, um, that women <clears throat> needed to, had some contradictions in the responses um, and having to ask questions again. So health professionals, as well as women, but primarily diverse health professionals who participated in this, um, medical um, specialists, so people, people around the table have participated, um, uh, midwives, diabetic educators, so we've had a, a social workers, had a vast array of 31 professionals participate in the interviews here. And the core elements of care that should be delivered for women receiving um, uh, on a journey with a high-risk pregnancy is collaborative care. Um, so really um, a team that's working well together. Continuity of carer, so whether that's with midwifery care or as appropriate another clinician, but con knowing, having a relational care with um, the providers of care, but also somebody who does a level of coordination. And when a model of care is in place that doesn't specifically have a continuity of care model, an alternative model is the coordination and navigation model, where the um, coordinator of care or navigator doesn't necessarily provide the clinical care, but ensures that the woman is supported along the journey to receive and access the services that are needed. Um, so to do this, a lot of underground work has to occur within the system. So the system must provide effective mechanisms of communication, um, the team having clarity of role, shared vision, team relationships, so time is required for this to happen, adequate resourcing around models of care, um, the clinical data system, so informational continuity is also really important because continuity can occur across the data systems and having and needs to occur in that way and having well-trained and supported staff, um, particularly in understanding and the, uh, working in a relational based way with women. Um, so I'll, I think that's probably my time there. So um, that's what we've, I, I guess, everybody is trying to work towards.
Great, thanks, Hannah. Uh, sorry, thanks, Virginia, for that incredible overview of what is a really complex um, system. Um, now to add another level of complexity, I'd like to um, introduce Professor Hannah Daler, who's a professor of midwifery, midwifery at Western Sydney University, who's going to uh, discuss with us birth in the time of COVID. Thank you very much, Angela. Is that looking okay, your end? It is. It is in, no, it's the, it's, you've got the presenter slide, so maybe swap displays. Okay, sorry. No, that's okay. Let's try that one. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. And it's really exciting to um, be here for, for today and see all the incredible work that everybody is actually um, undertaking. And I come to you from beautiful Durham country on a magnificent day. And uh, this country is and always was Aboriginal country. What I wanna talk about today is our birth in the time of COVID study in a very short period. So I will be bouncing through some, some ideas fairly, fairly rapidly. So just to kind of uh, introduce the team, first of all, a huge thanks to the SPEAR um, group who have funded uh, this study. We've done it on the smell of an oily rag. Uh, which has been uh, a huge effort on behalf of everybody. We began with a, a team, which is that first lot of names there that were all members of Sphere. And we got contacted by disaster researchers from the Queensland Flood Study and from Canada to join in and contribute their specific skills when it comes to um, the psychological element of the pandemic. And that's enhanced this research um, amazingly. We also have a wonderful consumer who keeps us honest. This was a mixed method study. Uh, it involved in-depth interviews with women, with midwives, with student midwives, from which we then developed surveys. It also had embedded in it a vocal app, which meant women could upload throughout their pregnancies um, voice recordings of what was happening for them. And then we interviewed them all after they had had the baby and went back over what they'd said. And that's provided wonderful data. We also then developed, as I said, um, really we developed three national surveys, one for midwives, one for student midwives and, and one for women. We then repeated that survey. We did them in 2020 and we did them in 2021. With the women, we're doing a longitudinal cohort study. We're following all those women up who agree at two months six months, 12 months, and now 24 months after the birth. So we've got some fantastic longitudinal data. Currently, we've got three papers published, another two under review and a further nine in progress. We have a Facebook page. If you want to look up a bit more around this, we've contributed through ways like seven conversation articles, lots and lots of media, including featuring in the Women's Weekly in December and more than 20 conferences and presentations and posters. So I thought I'd just give you a very brief overview of what has come out so far and what we're um, looking at next. So the very first paper that we published was led by one of our medical interns, which was fantastic. Um, and it was called Never Let a Good Crisis Go to Worse. And we really looked at the positives. We asked women in the surveys, was there anything positive in the pandemic you wish would continue? And we found that women said um, having fewer visitors in the, in the hospital increased access to telehealth services were the most common positives reported by both women and midwives. We also found having continuity of midwifery care, birthing at home, having a partner work from home were highlighted as positives. Just on the telehealth, we're now looking at the negatives. There also were substantial negatives, but certainly for some women, telehealth worked really well, particularly multiparous women with children at home, etc. The second paper, which was led by one of our psychologists on the team, is where we looked at what led to greater perinatal depression during the pandemic. And we found definitely there was elevated depressive symptoms amongst uh, women, both at pregnancy and in po postnatal period. And we found living in Victoria, having lower education, current mental health problems, and having greater non-pandemic related prenatal stress, as well as being over 35, or having physical or health issues increase the risk of you having depression postnatally. Also things like greater family discord, lower socioeconomic, lower social support um, were all associated with higher rates. And where greater depression was associated with increased social distancing and also pandemic related news exposure, which is something we're looking at in greater detail on how the news actually contributed to women's anxiety and depression. 
And the third paper that we've had published this year is looking at objective and subjective distress and mental health. We built into the COVID surveys um, a, a, a particular scoring mechanism with a series of questions that measured both objective hardship and um, subjective um, hardship and, and distressed. And we found that actually in a nutshell, having a positive attitude, having a high sense of resilience actually was enormously protective in reducing um, anxiety and depression following the birth. So how do we make more strengths-based skills happen in women? How do we actually work on how to protect them during these very stressful times? We've also got a, a paper which is under review at the moment looking at vaccine hesitancy amongst women. We found this is the most recent um, survey looking at 2021 and over to 2022. We found vaccine hesitancy, in fact, when we divided it into two time periods, has slightly increased recently. It is higher in states other than New South Wales, you're non university educated and those dissatisfied with life. Um, and vaccine hesitancy is, is lower in women who are um, over 30, higher income and greater than 28 weeks. And if they have pregnancy risk factors. Postnatally, when we look at the women's responses to that, we find that their hesitancy um, their vaccine hesitancy postnatally has increased in other states other than New South Wales and Victoria, or if under private obstetric care, but again reduced in women who are in the highest socioeconomic areas or have pregnancy risk factors. So we have lots and lots of work in progress. Uh, we, we've got some telehealth papers, PPE papers, looking at what women and midwives thought about telehealth. We've also got papers around more papers coming on vaccines, as I said, the vocal app paper and the social media paper. One of the really exciting bodies of work we're doing right now is looking at models of care and which models of care were protective for women regarding birth outcomes, which is a paper I'm leading, maternal mental health, which is a paper our psychologist is leading, and new infant neuro development, which is another paper that one of our infant uh, development psychologists is leading. And of course, looking at things like, you know, uh, feeding outcomes. We've also looked at reproductive choices. It appears that there is a group of women that have put off having another baby because they don't want to go through it again in the pandemic, childbirth education, student midwives, midwives experiences, etc. So lots of work to do and lots of interesting findings. And I just want to end by really thanking the women and the midwives and the student midwives who took time to complete what were very long surveys. And I want to thank the rest of the amazing BIDOC research group for the many roles that they play. This was a big multidisciplinary group and our multidisciplines actually enhanced this study amazingly. And what's really exciting is we are retaining women up to two years in the two year study we're getting up to nearly a thousand women who are still responding to our surveys after all this time. Overall, we've had over 6,000 women respond to the two surveys in 2020 and 2021. Thank you very much. Great, thanks Hannah, that was great work. Um, so from the uh, story of women in COVID-19 to um, the story of one woman's journey um, during, through our healthcare system, um, I'd like to introduce um, a pre-recorded video that Murma Said Ahmed has put together about her journey uh, through our healthcare system and her, um, and her contact with preeclampsia. Um, I think it's important to note that Murma put this together herself. Um, it's an in incredible video.
I'd just like to thank Loma for that piece. I mean, it was, I think, incredibly powerful and um, really, I think, reminds us why we're all here. So thank you. Next, I wanted to introduce Dr. Anchi Mu. Uh, Anchi is a relatively newcomer to Australia, so welcome. Um, she's um, worked in a variety of different places ar around the world, most recently in the UK, um, with a group called the Fetal Medicine Foundation, and that's also where my research beginnings were. And um, the Fetal Medicine Foundation has done a lot of work in risk prediction and prevention for a variety of different conditions, uh, including preeclampsia. And um, I thought that Angie could provide a slightly different take on where this is going um, over the next few years. So thank you, Angie. Thank you, Phil. Thank you so much for in inviting me today. Let me share the presentation. There we go. Um, Yes, so thank you uh, for your attention. And here I am to share with you my experience at the FMF regarding screening and prevention of preeclampsia. Um, so I'd like to start pointing out that there are several uh, guidelines for and uh, models for first trimester prediction for preeclampsia. However, I wanted to point out how the FMF first trimester prediction model is the one with the highest prefer performance. If you compare that, um, with the prior but a nice guideline which only consists and considers the maternal background factors, FMS performance uh, is at 75% for preterm preeclampsia and 45% for term preeclampsia when compared to the NICE guideline which only can achieve to 39% for preterm and 34% for term. And when we compare that of the American College, it is only 5% for preterm and 2% for term preeclampsia. Now, once we, with improvement and screening model of uh, screening for preeclampsia came the ASPRE trial that Prof mentioned already. This is just a very summary, a very short summary. And I just wanted to point out how um, aspirin really had no impact in reducing the incidence or the rate for term preeclampsia, whereas aspirin really did improve the incidence for other um, preeclampsia that happened before 37 weeks. Many, many efforts has been um, tried to improve prediction for preeclampsia for term preeclampsia. So you can see here different uh, combinations between maternal factors, between maternal factors and mean arterial pressure, uterine artery, uh, blood chemistry such as PLGF and s that we've already heard um, them mentioned today, and all three. You can see that for preterm preeclampsia, uh, early preeclampsia, for preterm preeclampsia, as we add the more markers, then the, uh, the detection rate increases. But for term preeclampsia, it's only reaches to a 41% of detection rates. Now, what happens if we try to screen for term preeclampsia later than 11 weeks? So uh, sadly, you can see here, oh, sadly you can see here that even if you try to screen around 19 to 34 weeks or 30 to 34 weeks, screening and detection for term preeclampsia continues to be low. Here on the left, you can see that screening at 19 to 24 weeks has high detection rate for early preeclampsia, high detection rate for preterm preeclampsia, but only a 33% detection rate for term preeclampsia. And if we try to perform the screening for term preeclampsia at 30 to 34 weeks, detection rate continues to be high for preterm before 37 weeks, but it only reaches to a 54% for preeclampsia happening after 37 weeks. But not everything is lost. Um, effective screening for term preeclampsia can, can be achieved when, when screening is performed and done at 30 to 36 weeks. Again, this is um, achieved by the FMS screening model where Prof Nikolai this would always say we have a prior risk and to that we add what we call the triple test. It's the biomarker um, known as the mean arterial pressure, uterine artery PI, and PLGF, and s -flit, and that would provide a personalized risk 
for each individual in each pregnancy. And the detection rate is up to 75% with the false positive rate of 9.9, .9, screen positive rate of 10%, and the cutoff would be more or equal to 1 to 20. Um, obviously, once we've reached to a what we consider a high performance uh, for detection for term preeclampsia, the very next question would be how do we prevent preeclampsia? And it's already been mentioned that it is uh, for term preeclampsia, it is the imbalance in between the pro-androgenic and the anti-androgenic factor with causes which can be detected and can be seen in the term preeclampsia. So that was uh, clearly used for in 2016 in the very first human trial trying to prevent preeclampsia. This is a um, trial where even though the sample size was small, uh, this uh, showed to be very promising. It, women were um, recruited around, around 12 to 16 weeks and um, they would be receiving either placebo or 10 milligrams of probastatin daily until delivery. And as I said, the results were very promising because while there were only four preeclampsia in the placebo group, there were zero in the probastatin group. And more, moreover, there were no reports of maternal, fetal, or neonatal serious events event, event, and no difference in side effects between the two groups. So this served as the base for our studying trial. This is a very quick summary of the study. It is a double-blinded placebo control multi-center trial. Screening was performed around 35 to 36 plus six weeks and the high risk uh, population would be offered to be randomized and um, they would be receiving, those who would accept the randomization would receive either placebo or 20 milligrams of provastatin daily until delivery or until 41 weeks. The sample size was calculated based on several points uh, that the performance of screening would detect 75% of the cases at a screen positive rate of 10%, the um, statistical power of 90% uh, up to a p-value of 0 0.5, uh, the hypothesis that preeclampsia can be reduced by half, noting that the incidence of preeclampsia in this high-risk population is not 3 to 5%, but it's 12%. Uh, Adding a possible 9% withdrawal throughout the, the trial, uh, we needed at least to randomize 1,120 patients because we predicted, pro predicted that probably only 50% of them would participate, then we needed at least 2,300 patients. And this would be just a high-risk population, which is 10%. So we needed at least to recruit 23,000 patients. The primary outcome we wanted to look at, or the objective was to see whether probastatin can reduce the incidence of term preeclampsia. So the secondary outcome had to do with the incidence of gestational hypertension, possible side effects or prevention of smallness uh, in the of the babies in the pregnancy, um, reduction or, uh, or whether it could um, avoid a stillbirth and neonatal death, uh, uh, the incidence uh, of placental abruption, rate of neonatal morbidity, whether provastatin is safe during pregnancy, and also look into whether provastatin can change and alter the relationship of split and PLGF after um, starting with provastatin. Um, the plan was, this is the follow-up, and the plan was to have the 36, 35 uh, weeks to do the randomization and do a weekly follow-up. So the first week after being randomized, they would, uh, we would ask them for a face-to-face -face meeting. We call them a, the first clinical visit. Uh, we would take a blood pressure, take a urine sample, have a look at their, their weight, take a blood sample for measurements and uh, double check with uh, ever whether there are side effects. And, and to ensure compliance, we would ask women to bring their tablets, the, the, the bottles, and we would count the remaining tablets. Second week after we um, enrolled uh, women's in the trial, we would perform a telephone interview just to double check and, and see whether they are suffering from any side effects to have them noted. And to ensure uh, compliance, we would ask the women to come for the tablets for us. 
third week after the randomization, we would ask for the women to come back again for their second face-to-face -face or second clinical visit, which is basically the same as the first one, but we would add a ultrasound scan to check on the fetal biometry, fetal dopplers, amniotic fluids. After the delivery, that would be our last visit. It should be, we, it was planned to be six weeks after the delivery, we do again what we always do in the in during their face-to-face -face visit and what we do is we retrieve the IMT the, the bottles that we uh, would be the uh, investigation on medical products and we would retrieve them at any of these follow-up appointment whether telephone interview or face-to-face -face, we would if there are any clinical concern any abnormal side effect we would refer them to hospital and if there were to be any clinical or muscle pain, we would then specifically request to be having the CK measured. With regards to our primary outcome, uh, saddens me to say that you can see here in the uh, this cumulative incident graph expressing percentage throughout the weeks that there were no uh, difference in the percentages of the incidence between the two groups, the placebo group and the probastatin group. Uh, moreover, you can see in the probastatin group, 80 women developed preeclampsia, that was a 14%, whereas in the placebo group, 74% of them developed preeclampsia, which is a 13.6%. So you can see here, really, there were no improvement in the probastatin group. Looking into the other outcomes, provastatin did not improve the rate for hypertensive disorder, the rate of smallness, the rate of stillbirth, placental abruption, adverse events, and neonatal morbidity. It is good to say that um, there were no concern regarding fetal and maternal safety when uh, subscribing and prescribing uh, statin, and it where there were no significant changes and different regarding the S-fleet and PLGF ratios uh, for those groups that received provastatin. Um, last but not least, I wanted to also very briefly mention the, um, the latest um, marker that we have been, it has been added to the FMF's um, model for to predict for term preeclampsia and that is the assessment of the ophthalmic artery doppler um, it is very easy to perform um, basically uh, we have the woman laid on, on in a supine position uh, with her eyes closed and some gel applied in the upper eyelid um, as in any doctor ultrasound a gel uh, color doppler would be applied to detect vessels. And um, you can see uh, that the ophthalmic artery would be running medially to the optic nerve, which is this hypoechoic hypo band that is right behind the ocular globe. And obviously to obtain the waveform, we need pulse wave doppler, which um, in the protocol, we needed to obtain three to five similar waves. Now coming into the characteristic, you can see here on the right that the ophthalmic arteries waveform is characterized by two peak systolic velocity. And it, it is the relation in between the second peak systolic velocity and the first one, the one that can, uh, the index that can improve prediction for term preeclampsia. And Prof. Nicoletti made it very clear that in several published papers that the recording data should be from coming from both eyes uh, to obtain a reproducible and to provide screening for performance. Now, uh, the potential to, of the ophthalmic artery in the screening was assessed into uh, different prospective observational study. The one is, this one is uh, the one performed and an, an, an assessed and examined uh, between the weeks 19 and 23. And the conclusion was the pixie tolly velocity ratio can improve for both the, the prediction for both preterm preeclampsia and term preeclampsia, not only individually, because uh, peak velocity systolic ratio has been proven to be superior as a individual marker when compared to, let's say, mean arterial pressure, uterine artery. 
but also peak velocity, peak systolic velocity can improve the um, prediction when in combination with other biomarkers. You can see here, this would be the detection rate for early or preterm the preterm the preeclampsia, and this would be for late preeclampsia. This is a detection rate for um, like alone without the ophthalmic artery. And you can see the moment we add the ophthalmic artery, the, the ratio, it can improve the detection rate to up to 90% for preterm preeclampsia and up to 51% for term preeclampsia. Like I said, uh, there was a second observational prospective study performed at 35 to 30 weeks, 37 weeks, uh, which examined 2,300 uh, total pregnancies, and the conclusion was that the peak systolic velocity ratio can predict for term preeclampsia at any stage, but also for those um, for imminent preeclampsia. And you can see here uh, on the top, on here on the right, that the prediction and the improvement uh, happens when in combination for only with maternal factors or maternal factors and only one. Uh, biomarkers. You can see here how in uh, this very first couple of um, here in this uh, maternal factor or maternal factor plus mean arterial pressure plus uterine artery, it can really improve. But the moment that you add more than one factor, it doesn't have really much of an impact for those imminent preeclampsia and preeclampsia at any time um, after assessment. So, to conclude, FMF is proposing a two-stage strategy to identify uh, pregnancies at high risk for preeclampsia. And that is uh, what FMF is proposing that should be considered as optimal approach. Now, the aim of the first stage would be to screen for uh, preeclampsia at 11 to 13 weeks, and that would help us reduce the prevalence of early and preterm preeclampsia through uh, through pharmacological intervention. And the second stage would be performing the screening around the third, second or third trimester. Uh, and the aim would be to improve perinatal outcome through let's say close monitoring of those uh, screen positive for high risk and aim for early detection of the clinical signs and therefore appropriate timing, place and mode of delivery. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Angie, for that incredible presentation and all work to prevent to prevent and identify women at risk is incredible. Um, so it's now time for Q&A. We've run a little bit over time, so we'll only have time for two quick questions. Um, as co-chair, I'd like to uh, take, take the position to ask um, Murma a question who's with us today. Um, Murma, as a result of that incredible experience that you had, can you tell us what you've learned from that journey that other women might find useful? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, Yes, uh, firstly, I want to thank you guys for um, allowing me to come and share my story with you guys. Um, secondly, um, you guys are doing an incredible job um, looking after people like me who has no education um, or anything about pregnancy at the time um, and looked after me really well. And I have now two beautiful um, young kids from the wonderful work that you guys um, did for me. And um, you yes. made an interesting comment once about how everyone in your family uh, had advice for you. Yeah, so um, after my um, wonderful experience, first ex experience, everyone um, ended up being doctors and um, was telling me that, you know, um, what you did was wrong, you shouldn't be carrying, you should be resting, you shouldn't be doing every day today, um, you know, lifestyle. You have to, you know, really self-care by sitting back and doing nothing. Um, but really, I don't think they understood that preeclampsia is something um, out of my control at the time. Um, and, you know, when the incident did happen and I had to explain to them, um, you know, it was a horrible experience. Um, but what I learned and gained out of that experience is I've met incredible people like you guys who you know, uh, made me undertake um, research that really helped, um, you know, uh, give me a better outcome. Um, yeah, so yeah, I think from this is um, I would love to, you know, uh, pretty much allow people to understand that 
there's prevention and um, we do have an amazing team, health team out there that can um, help people like me who had no idea what preeclampsia was. Great. Thanks, Thanks very much. Cheers. And I think that's an important thing for all of us to understand is what we as clinicians say is not necessarily what the, what the patient hears from um, their other friends and family and support. Um, there was one other question that I'd like to, I might ask Renuka to answer. Uh, since women with cardiovascular disease might already be on aspirin, are these women less likely to develop preeclampsia? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, Okay, there is a possibility that the use of aspirin um, in these women can minimize the risk of preeclampsia. However, there are certain things that need to be optimized. So for one is based on our current understanding, we perhaps will have to adjust the dose of aspirin to 150 milligrams daily. But more importantly, we need to emphasize to the women on the adequate um, in, on the need for adequate adherence and safety of aspirin in pregnancy, because quite often women get a bit alarmed and concerned with continuation of certain medications in pregnancy. And so this is where the communication part really comes to play. So emphasizing the importance of adherence and helping them understand that there's an additional role for aspirin in this context. But also if these women have underlying chronic um, cardiovascular disease, they often would but perhaps have concurrent hypertension or diabetes that also needs to be optimized to further minimize their risk of preeclampsia in their pregnancy. Great. Thanks, Renuka. Um, so with that, we'll draw the Q&A to a close. And I'd like to invite Professor Josephine Chow to close the session. Thanks, Angela. Yeah. Now, thank you for all of you. Again, this is not the one of online virtual uh, seminar for the Health and Beyond Research Innovation Showcase for 2022. Uh, but I have to say that it's always one of the best ones. Uh, the, the story from the consumer, from the patient is so touched and it's so real that uh, I think it's a lot of people actually start to have a little bit of uh, emotion tearing um, and, and it's a real story and it's really important. All right, so the session and the presentation were excellent and outstanding. All right, congratulations to uh, Professor Matthews and Professor Hyer and the important work they have been already done for the community in uh, the local health district in South Western City. And of course, more work will be done. And in particular, uh, thank you for Professor Hennessy and Professor Matthews. They actually lead the virtual academic unit. Um, it's an investment. When I say investment, it's a funding from uh, the local health district of $2.25 million over the five years, and they have done a sensational job and work today. And with um, Professor Hayes, no pressure on coming on. <laughs> it's really important. And the LHG classified the pregnancy women's health as one of our highest priority. All right, so you can actually imagine all this happening, uh, and it's really important work for the community, very exciting. So uh, Tiga and the Ingham Institute can't do that without the technology support. And uh, Anna Marie, Rachel and Mara from uh, the research directory, they like really seamlessly get everything done without any issue at all. So it's really good for organizing it. Um, and again, uh, if you miss the session or any of your colleagues miss the session, just encourage them to go to the website and then it's actually recording there. Uh, I think it, what this afternoon or tomorrow? Yeah, soon. All right. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, keep in tune as well because in September, on the 12th of September, yep, yeah, uh, Professor Susie Collar will be leading the team talking about gut and microbiome. And then they will have the presentation. And I'm pretty sure they have all the presentation speakers all lined up for that as well. And once again, thank you for making it time today. And I look forward to seeing you around in the LHD, the warmer sub summer coming. I know it's a better winter, but it's really important. And particularly, I think great work for the academic unit. Thank you so much.